He's one of the most controversial people in Britain. You can't be politically correct when you're doing a job like mine. Jeremy Clarkson is sometimes unwisely provocative. He's someone who seems to like to provoke. He wants to get a reaction. Well, I've sparked fury. Well, I've always sparked fury every day. Jeremy will have a go at anybody who is in English, really. Like, his two pet peeves are Americans, American cars, and electric cars. And for over 30 years, he's been shocking the nation. He suddenly says, killing a prostitute, as if that's part of a truck driver's normal duties. You just go, oh, no, I've said that out loud. Sometimes even resorting to violence. Yeah, I punched him. Yeah. <laughs> now, you're 43 years of age. And then you hit the editor of a national newspaper. He's upset politicians. I think that outrageous, and Jeremy Clarkson should apologise for those comments. The BBC. I've been suspended, haven't I? We will not be renewing Jeremy's contract. Entire countries. Well, Switzerland is a waste of time. And even his fellow presenters. I've said many times before, the man is a knob, but I quite like him. There's nobody alive today who hasn't left a party thinking, oh, God, why did I say that? You know, we do it, particularly me. It tends to be in front of millions. You hear what he said and you think, my God, did he really say that? I'm not a PC person. But most recently, his comments about Meghan Markle became the most complained newspaper article in history. He dreams of the day, he says, when she is paraded naked through the streets of every town in Britain while the crowds chant shame and throw lumps of excrement at her. With speculation now surrounding his future, has Clarkson finally gone too far? Doesn't matter how many times he gets, you know, in hot water because of it, he will keep saying the wrong thing. I'm just an ordinary bloke. Or will the king of controversy live to fight another day? Morning, Jeremy. Jeremy, how are you? For years, Jeremy Clarkson has made a lucrative career out of saying the most outrageous things and seemingly getting away with it. However, at the end of 2022, many felt that his controversial opinions had taken a step too far. More than 6,000 complaints have been made to IPSO, the independent press standards organisation, following comments made by Jeremy Clarkson about Meghan Markle in a newspaper column. In The Sun, Clarkson wrote he dreamed of throwing excrement at the Duchess of Sussex while she was made to parade naked in the streets. My God, did he really say that? Jeremy has an ability to offend. He has to take it to the extreme, and he manages to offend huge amounts of people. So where does his confrontational personality come from? To find out, we need to go back nearly 50 years for the first of Clarkson's controversial moments to a young boy growing up at school in Derbyshire. <laughs> 1970s Britain. At Repton, an exclusive private boarding school, one of its students was working on a future career in controversy. You had all the, the, all the opportunities going to that posh school, didn't you? Yeah. That public school. Oh, now, yeah. you see, if you're thinking of paying for your son's education, look at Jeremy here. So did you never want to be anything when you were a little kid? I quite wanted to be an astronaut or king or a rock star, and none of those things were, were actually ever going to happen. Well, my experience of men who went to private schools or public schools is that they don't kind of grow up in a real world way. It's almost like there's so many rules in place and there's such a hierarchy, many of them stay in a kind of a sort of permanent state of adolescence. And I think that is very much the case with Jeremy. I throw a fairly well-known Halloween party most years and uh, I always invite Jeremy. It's fancy dress. I always say, well, you've got to come in fancy dress. You've got to be fancy dressed. He'll turn up in his normal clothes. I'll say, what have you come as? He says, I've come as Jeremy Clarkson, which frankly isn't good enough. If anybody was going to blow up the chemistry lab and get away with it, it would be young Clarkson. Jeremy is the kind of the, the sort of the big boy, really, who will cause trouble, but doesn't mind taking the rap for it. According to Clarkson, education was far from his mind got into smoking, got into girls, got into music, and then I got lobbed out of school. Jeremy Clarkson was expelled from his public school, Repton, 
reputedly for drinking, smoking and making a general nuisance of himself. What would have happened if the headmaster had known that he was going to continue doing that and it was going to turn and transmogrify into the most lucrative and spectacularly successful career? He started young. He was expelled from school with a C and two U's at A-level. He's always been a rebel. Jeremy merely thinks rules are there to be broken. So I would imagine that the uh, public school was the ideal test for him. Did it hold him back? Not at all. If you got his DNA and you sort of unstitched it and look at what it spelt, it would just say rule breaker. Clarkson's poor grades didn't hold him back, a point that he's very fond of making on Twitter every August on the day of the A-level results. In 2022, his tweet read, I got a C and two U's, and I'm currently holidaying on this boat. I didn't, I've never had an ambition ever. You can't, I don't think ambitions are a good idea. Because if you have an ambition, you either achieve it, in which case, so what, or you don't, in which case you live a life of misery. So it's best never to have an ambition and just take every day as it comes. I think that's probably the best. And then look where you end up. So how did Jeremy Clarkson end up becoming the controversial national figure he is today? Well, it all started in 1977 when he discovered driving. In 1977, Jeremy Clarkson was 17, and having been kicked out of school, he considered working in the family business, selling stuffed Paddington bears that his parents were making. My mum started selling Paddington. She's still dimly aware that probably wasn't allowed, but there were no laws or rules on it. But like their son, it seemed Clarkson's parents may not have been fond of playing by the rules. The problem was that they hadn't had permission from Michael Bond, the creator of Paddington Bear. So my dad was summoned by Michael Bond's lawyers to London and met Michael Bond in the lift going up to the lawyers' meeting. Michael said, I really like this bed. It doesn't really matter what happens in the meeting, but I really want, I want you to carry on making it. They reached a settlement and the Clarkson Paddington Bears became wildly successful. But if Jeremy had plans to become a travelling salesman for the family business, he needed to learn how to drive. Which he decided to do in his grandfather's car. Who does that? Who takes a driving test in a Bentley car? I think that's quite telling of the character. I can picture Jeremy Clarkson passing his driving test in a combine harvester. That's Jeremy making a statement. He likes making statements, and the bigger and the more shocking, the better. And the only person nervous on his driving test would have been the instructor. Jeremy was so confident he'd pass first time that he brought scissors to remove the L-plates of the car. However, at first, his confidence was greater than his ability. Jeremy enthusiastically and unashamedly told his fellow Top Gear presenters all about that euphoric feeling after the examiner informed him he'd passed. When he said, the man, whatever he was, the instructor, examiner, examiner. when he said, congratulations, Mr. Clarkson, you've passed, what I heard was, congratulations, Mr. Clarkson, you are the best driver I've ever seen in my <laughs> life. And so you can imagine my surprise 36 hours later to find myself in a field surrounded by sheep that were no longer alive and bits of what used to be my mum's Audi. <laughs> it's almost compulsory for Jeremy to crash her car straight after he passes his driving test in a Bentley. I mean, what part of that did, did Mrs Clarkson miss? Crashing his mum's car may have made for typically entertaining TV, but passing his driving test clearly fueled his passion for petrol. However, nothing could have prepared Jeremy Clarkson or the world for what happened next. Coming up, Clarkson lands his first job. He was really loud and opinionated. And he devises a show that'll take the world by storm. It's a programme based on deep but passionate loathing. With Jeremy Clarkson's career now in the balance after his comments about Meghan Markle, we're revealing the moments which have made Clarkson the king of controversy. Nineteen seventy-eight, Rotherham, South Yorkshire. A young Clarkson had crashed his mum's car shortly after passing his driving test. 
Now, he needed a job. With few qualifications, things didn't look promising until he had a chance encounter with a newspaper journalist who knew his grandfather. We heard this new guy was starting Monday morning. They brought him in, you had to duck down under the door frame. He was up to about six foot six, accentuated by this bushy hair. Clarkson's new job was as a rookie reporter on the local newspaper, the Rotherham Advertiser. He started work, uh, rather stood out for his size. We thought, wow, I thought, looked like Phil Lynott from Thin Lizzy, with all that hair. And um, pretty striking figure, actually. And surprise, surprise, from day one, Jeremy was a law unto himself. It was compulsory to have shirt and tie, but what I specifically remember about Jeremy was the tight blue denim jeans and the brown Cuban heel boots. Back then, it was manual typewriters. There weren't any computers. There wasn't the internet. And when they were all typing, it was like the newsroom was singing. It was a really exciting place to be. It felt like you were the centre of the world. But Clarkson didn't quite fit in. He was really loud and opinionated as his time went on there. So that created sometimes arguments, but he had his own strong opinions, like, like he, he has subsequently. Then one day he heard of an opportunity that seemed too good to be true. One of the kids on a local paper, he turned up one day with a brand new Lancia. We were only about 18, I said, where did you get that from? He said, great gig. Just do a little piece in your local paper about cars. You get a free car every week. And I just thought, well, I can do that. Clarkson had, however, crashed his mum's car just hours after passing his driving test. So surely no one would give him a job that involved cars. We always knew that he wanted to move on to the motoring world and writing about cars. Clarkson shocked everyone by somehow landing himself the job of motoring correspondent at the Shropshire Star. And having been let loose on an unsuspecting public, it wouldn't be long before his views jumped from print to a much wider audience. Nineteen eighty-seven, and it was at a party that young journalist Jeremy Clarkson would meet a man who would change his life. He was actually discovered by a friend of mine, John Bentley. John Bentley was a producer of a relatively unknown BBC motoring show called Top Gear, who were looking for a presenter to give the show a shot in the arm. Remember when Top Gear started, it was seen as a little niche show. It wasn't like the big, the juggernaut it became, and it was a nerd show. Bentley was convinced that Clarkson was the man to turn Top Gear's fortunes around. Applaud it to John because he saw something in him and wow, what an incredible talent that he did discover. You customise a Ford Capri, you do not customise a modern day Bentley or Rolls Royce. As we can see from one of his first appearances on the show in 1988, Clarkson was opinionated from the start. Now, this one, for instance, is seriously lacking in the door department. At first, he was on his best behaviour. He was prepared to dress and to speak in the manner of BBC presenters of that time. Coordinated windscreen wipers, very tasty. One of the few times he followed convention. He, first of all, sounds ridiculous. Back in the 80s, if you worked for the BBC, you had to talk a bit like that. We didn't even realise. And Clarkson did as well. Isn't he incredible? He looks pretty ridiculous. Finally, it's all topped off with these polished chrome wheels. So nobody can quite forget this peculiar fellow in this suit with the accent. That's Jeremy Clarkson. <laughs> But it wasn't long before Clarkson ditched the suit, the accent, and the sensible reviews for something more shocking. One of his early appearances on Top Gear was shot in the south of France, and in an effort to make the car appear more exciting, Clarkson made one of his first televised controversial comments. And on top of all that, it's the first Ford that I can remember which looks good enough to snap knicker elastic at 50 paces. 
well. This was absolute catmint to the critics. Did it mean that he was misogynistic? Who's knicker elastic? Would it snap? Was this demeaning to women? Anyway, it was fabulous because everybody was outraged except for the people who loved it. Jeremy Clarkson, absolutely at the forefront of the news. Job done. I'm wearing a, an especially scandalous thong today. I suspect whatever car that was, it could probably remove this from me. And you were driving one car and you said, this is, this is the sort of car that would snap, snap a girl's knicker elastic at 200 yards. Aha! Aha! That was a misquote. I said it would snap knicker elastic at 50 paces and never said girls, which was my big defence with all the big bosses that said I was sexist. Jeremy was starting to make a name for himself. Jeremy changed television. He changed the way that it was presented and what you could and couldn't say, or rather, what you could say because he would say everything. And he wasn't just airing his controversial views on television, he also wrote for several newspapers. I was the motoring editor of The Sun, and Jeremy uh, asked to write a column on my pages. Back then, when we first met, he had a fine head of hair, and he had a great presence. When he walked into a room, people turned round and looked, which, of course, Jeremy loved because uh, he does like to be the centre of attention. The Jeremy Clarkson we all know today was starting to take shape. But it wasn't all good news for the motoring world. With Jeremy Clarkson as its new presenter, Top Gear on the BBC was starting to attract attention. He was... Um, much braver and bolder about saying compared to most other broadcasters I've worked with. You know, if he thought something was rubbish, he just said it was utterly rubbish. I had a great time working with him. It was really enjoyable and eye-opening as well, how he got involved with the entire editorial. But his reviews, both on TV and in print, were beginning to push boundaries and gave Clarkson more power than even he could have thought possible. In 1995, Vauxhall brought out a new model of the Vauxhall Vectra. Clarkson was sent one to review. The Vauxhall Vectra uh, review on Top Gear is pretty much legendary, to be honest, on television. As we can see yeah, from this no. early Top Gear clip, an irate Jeremy no, Clarkson made a fictitious to... phone call to his producer. I'm telling you, it's just a box on wheels. He absolutely slates it and hates it. In the new motor he world. pretended to have little to say about the car oh. and was reluctant to extend his review. But that'd be the most boring piece of television since the potter's wheel. He was meant to road test it and he, the car's there in shot and he walks up to it. And I mean, you know, you're expecting a full road test. But instead, oh, Clarkson yeah, continued yeah, the farce, yeah, refusing yeah. to properly review the car. Been a lovely summer, though, hasn't it? I think the Vauxhall Vectra review was actually a watershed in, in British TV. It was suddenly saying, look, we're bigger than you. If you don't want to send us any more cars, don't send them. We're going to tell the truth about this car, and it's shite. Good evening. The much-reduced British car industry has suffered another major blow. Although many found Jeremy Clarkson's style amusing and refreshingly honest, it seemed his reviews were starting to have direct repercussions on the car manufacturers. The Vauxhall car plant at Luton in Bedfordshire is to be closed by its parent company, General Motors. There was about 2,500 jobs at Luton that were hanging on it. You know, this was a crucially important car for Vauxhall. When Jeremy came along, if you put your car on top gear, you were taking a risk. If your car wasn't very good or didn't tick enough boxes, the consequences could be colossal. With the Vectra panned by reviewers and on the way out, General Motors had promised a new model, code name Epsilon in the company. That will now go to Germany alone. Manufacturers did ring me in a desperate state. You've got to do something about this. What can you do about it? You can't do this. My reply, sadly, was rather simple to them. Nothing. Jeremy is hired because he's the most contentious motoring writer in the country. You know, he writes what he thinks. I believe, though, some car companies don't like you because you've slagged them some? off. Some? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> why, 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 why do you do that? Well, well, why do I say that cars are rubbish? Yeah. Well, it would be very easy, I know, to go on and say they're all absolutely lovely except for the shape of the ashtray, but, I mean, I think, yeah, the car's the second most expensive thing that someone buys. You've got to tell it how it is. Clarkson's reputation as an outspoken presenter was spreading, but his career seemed to come to an abrupt halt 
when the BBC decided to put an end to Top Gear. So Clarkson embarked on a series of smaller TV programmes that would see him start to build on the two characteristics he knew got him attention, conflict and outrage. In 2001, while the rest of us were surviving the new millennium, Jeremy Clarkson was looking for a new garden ornament. In this clip, Jeremy Clarkson used his now infamous dry wit to mock up a Yellow Pages advert for an innovative new TV show. Oh, you do? Could you, could you put one aside for me? He's decided he wants to buy himself an old aircraft, and he asks for, I think it's a lightning... <laughs> It's a 60s plane, and at one stage it was sort of the mainstay of the Royal Air Force. The ornament that Jeremy had ordered was an English electric lightning fighter jet, a supersonic interceptor used during the Cold War. The fact that we're talking about Jeremy putting a jet fighter plane in his garden is pretty much as ludicrous as it comes, isn't it? This would be one of Jeremy Clarkson's first stunts. From the beginning, he was being as shocking as possible to get a reaction from those around him. He was just like a little schoolboy. Oh, look what I've got. I've got a lightning. Then he wants it in a spe specific part of the lawn. Jeremy's plan soon began to unravel. The biggest problem came as we towed it up the lawn. I don't know the weight of an RAF lightning, tornado, jet, whatever. Clearly, neither does Jeremy Clarkson, but I'll tell you this you don't want to move one on a lawn that's quite wet and it's had a lot of rain recently because that front wheel is just going to dig in, dig in, dig in. They have effectively done an irrigation trench to get it where they want the plane to be. Now for the tricky bit. Hello, dear. They have to tow it up the drive. And then the then Mrs Clarkson comes out and let's just say she's not hugely impressed. And you complain about the moles? The star of the jet fighter moment was Mrs. Clarkson, without any doubt at all. It's a bloody mess of our lawn, that's what it you is. You knew what I was like when you married me. You knew I was going to do this. It wasn't just his wife who was unimpressed to find a jet fighter in the garden. The local council also made inquiries. Jeremy Clarkson defended himself in a typically brash manner. He tells the council, this is not a fighter jet, this is a giant leaf blower. I suspect you could use a jet as a leaf blower. So he wasn't necessarily lying, but clearly that wasn't what it was designed for. Clarkson's fighter jet was removed, but what he failed to say was that the whole performance was just a stunt for a new TV series, Speed. The Clarkson brand and profile was taking shape, and a couple of years before Speed, the nation's biggest broadcaster had made another irresistible offer, his own chat show, Clarkson. It was an outlet for him to freely express his views, as he did in this 1999 clip when he read out one of his early complaint letters to Terry Wogan. Only this week, the MP for Rotherham took umbrage at something I said last week and has said in a press release, which has been quoted in a lot of newspapers, that Jeremy Clarkson is a patronising, self-important, snide, two-faced, self-hating, arrogant waste of an NUJ card, if he has one. <laughs> It's hard, hard to criticise that, isn't it? <laughs> the show helped Clarkson cement his controversial credentials. Then Clarkson had a big idea that would get him into the heart of the BBC, this time with real power. In 2002, Clarkson teamed up with Andy Willman, an old school friend who also happened to be an ex-Top Gear presenter. Together, they attempted to convince the BBC that between the two of them, they could revive Top Gear. Jeremy Clarkson had a much bigger vision. He said, give me Top Gear, give it to me and Andy Willman, my mate and colleague, and we will supersize it, we'll turbocharge it, we'll make this program something, an event, unmissable, a really big deal. Despite the fact that the BBC had already taken Top Gear off the air and that Clarkson was proving himself to be a highly controversial figure, the corporation agreed. Clarkson was allowed to fulfil his editorial vision of a new reimagined Top Gear. Of course, Top Gear 
was a BBC show, but really what made it the show it was, was the people on it. Disgusting. I like that one. That's disgusting, it's red. Jeremy brought on Richard Hammond, and I believe this was Jeremy's choice. So the reboot started, it was Jeremy, he'd got Richard Hammond with him. And he obviously knew Hammond, and he knew the dynamics and how he could bounce off him as, a, as a, another presenter. And then James May joined a couple of months later. And what an addition, and that was it. That was what they needed, the three amigos. Perfection. Did you really get on in real life? No. 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 Is that why you're standing so far away from me? Yes. yes. It's, no. it's, it's a programme <laughs> well, based it's... on deep but passionate loathing. And mutual. It's really the only thing we share, an absolute hatred for one another. Yeah. That's we very We had this discussion That's... before. We thought, are there anything that, things that we agree on? And we came up with sandwich spread, the BMW 135i, and the fact that we all hate each other. Those are the three things on which we were united. It was that very special chemistry between Jeremy and Richard and the other bloke, James. I remember once I, I got him to try and admit that he loved them. I want you to admit that you love the other two <laughs> and, and that you would miss them terribly if anything happened to either of them. There's a man love there. And he was very reluctant to do so, but it, there clearly is that love. And it's the kind of love, I suppose, that I, I suspect he went to a public school. It's the kind of thing where they were never you know, never allowed to admit to having emotions for anyone. You've got to look at those boys and you've got to know, I miss them and I want to kiss them and hug them and smell their hair. <laughs> and I want to dance with them under the moon barefoot. <laughs> Any feelings whatsoever were beaten out of them, I believe, by the age of about seven. But obviously, they, there's still some residual under the surface. As well as a crack presenting team, Jeremy Clarkson and Andy Willman decided to build a studio at Dunsfold Aerodrome in Surrey. They laid out a test track on the old runway and also introduced a new character. A man who would become the mainstay of Top Gear and a public figure, even though he never showed his face. He witnessed Jeremy Clarkson firsthand from behind the mask. Hello, my name's Perry McCarthy. I was the original Stig on Top Gear. The Stig was a, a yardstick. It was the common way of testing any car. How good was the Stig? The idea of the track being the same. It was about the racetrack and the different studio. And just this sense that Clarkson now owned it and he was doing it himself. And he gave more of himself to it. And that's why it worked so well. Many were surprised that the BBC appeared to have given Clarkson so much control over such a high-profile series. But the show's ratings steadily climbed. This gave him a licence to be even more controversial. He suddenly says, killing a prostitute. Top Gear presenter Jeremy Clarkson's in trouble again. There have been thousands of complaints. Then, to add to the controversy, he appeared to challenge the rules around drinking and driving. May pulls out a cool box with a bottle of gin <laughs> and offers a gin and tonic. And he's voted worst dressed man. He looks like a walking charity shop. Despite a growing reputation as a controversial presenter, in 2002, Jeremy Clarkson and his friend Andy Willman had persuaded the BBC to give them control of Top Gear. Clarkson now had a licence to heavily influence the direction of the show, with increasing disregard for whatever anybody else thought. And part of his plan for Top Gear was to shock the nation with ambitious and controversial stunts. One of the first of these stunts took place during a 2003 episode of Top Gear. Jeremy started by enthusiastically explaining that the vehicle they were using hadn't been tampered with. We haven't made any mechanical alterations to the car at all. So it's, it's not really a review of a new Toyota. I mean, it's certainly not a, a new Toyota. It's a really old one. They set out to destroy the Toyota Hilux, and they did it with a massive budget. They took this pickup and how the hell it survived everything that it did. And they're going to smash it up and put it on a causeway at the seven bore. 
the car came off the tethers and ended up drowning for hours. They didn't know if they were going to get it back. It had come out of the sea. It had been tied down by lifeboat men and women. I mean, it was incredible. And it was almost like a Disney movie. I think they swung a sort of wrecking ball into it. They did everything to it. And they set it on fire. Suddenly, it was resurrected. It came alive again. To the amazement of Jeremy and the team, the Toyota was still drivable. It comes in, and if you look carefully, the man who's driving it, the windscreen's gone. The windscreen. So he's having to drive it by leaning, <laughs> leaning out, because that's the only way he can get it on. So we were whooping. Me and my two boys were whooping with Lee. The car lives! The car lives! I think that was one of the greatest stunts they ever did. The reaction of the audience was amazing. The era of the eye-catching and unrestrained Top Gear stunt had arrived. I remember watching it at the time, thinking, this is not a review show of new cars anymore. This is something completely different. It's insane, isn't it? What kind of programme does that? Top Gear. Jeremy Clarkson had hit on a winning formula. Over-the-top, ridiculous and reckless stunts would be key to making Top Gear a huge success. But at the same time as Top Gear was taking off, Clarkson's enthusiasm for shocking the audience was beginning to take hold. With a high level of creative freedom, Clarkson was heading out of control. I'm going in here to talk on the radio. In 2008, the country was reeling from the news that the so-called Suffolk Strangler, Steve Wright, had recently been found guilty of murdering five prostitutes. He'd previously worked as a lorry driver. It was a piece of news that Clarkson decided to reference in an episode of Top Gear, during which he struggled to drive a 60-ton lorry around the track. Because this is a hard job, and I'm not just saying this to win favour with lorry drivers, it's a hard job. Change gear, change gear, change gear, check your mirrors. He's in the cabin and he's talking about really pedestrian stuff, about changing gear and stepping on the accelerating and, and pulling over. But he doesn't want the piece just to be about hard-working lorry drivers. Change gear, change gear, change gear, check your mirrors, murder a prostitute, change gear, change gear, murder, check your mirrors. That's a lot of effort. He suddenly says, killing a prostitute, as if that's part of a truck driver's normal duties. And, in fact, it, it said so quickly as part of this piece to camera in the cabin that you, you actually miss it the first time. You have a thing of, what did he say? And you think, oh, it can't have been that. Jeremy's remark infuriated relatives of women who'd been murdered by Steve Wright and another lorry driver, the Yorkshire Ripper. I think at the time, the families of those prostitutes who'd been murdered and also lots of other people thought, God, that's incredibly distasteful. And the next day, then, all the truck drivers go mad. And then also prostitute collectives, sex workers collectives go mad. Media watchdog Ofcom accepted the remarks could shock some viewers, but cleared Clarkson, ruling that the comments were being made for comic effect and in keeping with the particular programme. So, despite their extreme nature, Clarkson had seemingly got away with it. Does Jeremy have an intent to shock viewers? Probably, probably. But it also suits his cause, just to pump up stories. For Clarkson, it was further confirmation that shock equaled attention, and he could push it to the limits without getting into trouble. So when the government launched a £10 million Know Your Limits campaign to raise awareness of alcohol abuse, questions were raised about Jeremy Clarkson's limits in the Arctic. The Top Gear Polar Special pitted Jeremy Clarkson and James May in a 4x4 against Richard Hammond with a dog team in a thrilling race across the frozen Arctic Ocean to the magnetic North Pole. Apart from the crew car, presumably, there is not another car within God knows how many miles on the frozen wastes. They're a bunch of upper fifth formers just having a laugh. It's like they've stolen the headmaster's car and they've decided they're going to trash it in the woods or something like this. They're racing across the frozen masses. But in a moment that would shock a nation, James May surprises driver Jeremy Clarkson with a drink normally made in a bar, not a car. Yes, I'd like a gin and tonic. Can't have a gin and tonic because we're in the Arctic Ocean. Not me. What? <laughs> You've got gin! May 
Jay pulls out a cool box with a bottle of gin <laughs> and offers a gin and tonic. In the clip, James May appears to pour gin and tonics for himself and Jeremy Clarkson. Now, this is Arctic exploration. Even though Clarkson was driving at the time, the viewer is led to assume he's drinking alcohol at the wheel. Please do not write to us about drinking and driving because I'm not driving, I'm safe. Despite Clarkson's pleas for viewers not to write in, the BBC received complaints. The show's producers defended the footage, saying the item was filmed in an uninhabitable area of the North Pole, in international waters, and they weren't shown to be drunk or not in control of the car. I mean, they're technically on the sea, and what are they going to bump into? The polar bear? You know the 49% are going to go completely berserk, as indeed they did. And he absolutely loves it, because most, let's be honest, most people thought it was great. Even though many people enjoyed the show, the BBC Trust agreed with a complaint that there had been a misuse of alcohol. However, Clarkson wasn't punished for his actions, nor did he apologise for his behaviour. In the name of entertainment, it was quickly brushed aside. Whilst Jeremy Clarkson had firmly established his provocative presenting style, it seemed he was less interested in developing his fashion style. He regularly featured on top 10 lists of the worst dressed men in Britain. It was yet another example of his love of non-conformity. I've been on best dressed and worst dressed lists, often in the same year. So, I feel his pain. His personality is so massive. I don't think you take too much notice of what he's wearing to a certain degree, unless you're Trini and Susanna. They fit, we can go. Oh, they fit, yeah, but do you like them? Yeah, no, they're Back fine. Back in 2002, in an episode of the TV show What Not To Wear, Trini and Susanna amusingly took on the challenge of sprucing up Jeremy's image. But they had their work cut out for them. In 2002, Trini and Susanna got their hooks into Jeremy Clarkson. They kind of were branding him one of the worst dressed men, so he went on their show. Trini and Susanna tried their best to turn his fashion sense around, but Clarkson was determined to be predictably uncooperative. Don't because need we to try want to see it we, yes, we, do we need to see it. it, for goodness sake. Despite Trini and Susanna's best efforts to spruce him up, Clarkson seemed happy to stick with the style he'd created. He's got this look, if you can call it that, jeans, a little on the bedraggled side, a shirt, usually sort of popping a bit because he's a bit too portly uh, for the buttons to do up, a belt of no particular provenance and a jacket that's shapeless and looks as if it probably should have been donated to a jumble sale long ago. Well, he does that on purpose, it's his trademark. I don't wear flash clothes for the television, I don't put makeup on, I don't look in a mirror before I do a piece to camera. I'm just an ordinary bloke. I imagine he probably leaves his house wearing very neatly ironed clothes and very smart looking good. And by the time he's reached his car, somehow, he looks like a walking charity shop. I like the fact that Jeremy doesn't really care what he looks like. And it's a bit slovenly. Sorry, Jeremy, but you do always look a bit rubbish. They're clothes that will outlive him. And I like to think that maybe one day those clothes will be given back to the nation. As Trini and Susanna discovered, Clarkson is not a man who wishes to be told what to wear, or what to do, or what to say, as another BBC show would soon discover. In 2011, public sector workers were on strike. This happened to coincide with Clarkson's appearance on primetime BBC magazine programme the one show. When you have Jeremy on your show, as I did, you know he's going to go as far as he can. As Matt Baker and Alex Jones introduced Jeremy Clarkson onto the show, they apprehensively alluded to the fact that he was likely to say something controversial. It's now at the end of a day when Britain has seen the biggest strikes in a generation, what we need is someone calm and level-headed. Yeah, a guest with balanced and controversial opinions who makes great efforts not to offend. And we've got Jeremy Clarkson. <laughs> <laughs> Put him in a politicised situation like that, he's going to go out of control. This was a classic BBC moment, and it, was, it, it came out of a sort of crazy thing the BBC was doing at the time, which is to say, if you give any political views, you must balance them. 
not saying that to presenters, they were saying it to guests. So you can see backstage, Clarkson has to sign this thing. And he says, what am I signing? And they say, oh, it's just the thing that says you've got to balance your views. Do you think the strikes have been a good idea? Oh, fantastic. Absolutely. <laughs> Never had. London today has just been empty. Clarkson decided to do as asked, and live on air, jovially told Alex and Matt that there were many positive sides to the strike. Airports, yeah. people streaming through with no problems at all. And then he almost lampoons the BBC by saying, oh, but I've told I need to balance that. It soon dawned on the one show presenters that Jeremy Clarkson's initially calm and measured comments were merely a build-up to a shocking punchline. We have to balance it, though, don't we? Because this is the BBC. I thought, oh, no, don't. Whatever happens, Alex, Matt, don't say, yes, you do. Exactly. Well, we, yes, exactly. <laughs> Frankly, I'd have them all shot. <laughs> I would take them outside and execute them in front of their families. I mean, how dare they go on strike when they've got these gilt-edged pensions that are going to be yeah. guaranteed while the rest of us have to work for a living? Yeah. <laughs> well, on that note of balancing an opinion, of course, those are Jeremy's views. <laughs> <laughs> I just... <laughs> It made an absolute mockery of whoever it was that was trying to get guests to sign something saying they would always give balanced views. Why on earth was the BBC doing that? Top Gear presenter Jeremy Clarkson's in trouble again. There have been thousands of complaints to the BBC after his comments about public sector strikers. For that time of day, what Clarkson said on the, on the one show really upset a lot of people. I think that outrageous and Jeremy Clarkson should apologise for those comments because he obviously doesn't understand the lives of the people who were going out on strike yesterday. Jeremy Clarkson at Heathrow today on his way to China and implying he'd been quoted out of context. I see what I actually said and then you can judge. <laughs> but others, including many supporters of yesterday's strike, failed to see the funny side. Tonight, the union welcomed Jeremy Clarkson's apology. Jeremy Clarkson may have apologised for his comments, but once again caused controversy. Coming up, the more controversial his statements were, the more popular he seemed to become. Except now, Clarkson had moved on to violence. Yeah, I punched him. Yeah. And things get messy. Oh, oh, oh good one! <laughs> Settle in. Simba Hybrid Mattress sponsors evenings on Channel 5. Crafted in Japan. Introducing the all-new Mazda CX-60 Plug-in Hybrid. Let's drive forward together. Search Mazda CX-60. What do you get if we don't find any abnormal results in your Newman blood test? A full refund. Monitor your health with a fear nothing blood test at Newman.com. Welcome to Lidl, where you can save on this big shop compared to Morrison's. We're always little on price, so you could save on all these essentials. Fill up on your five a day and bag big brands without breaking the bank. Switch from Morrison's to Lidl and save over thirty pounds on this like for like big shop. Now that's big on quality and always little on price. into your local pure gym and get way more than you pay for with no joining fee and memberships from just 15.99 a month pure gym way more than you pay for with your free credit score and report you can be clear score sure you'll find credit card and loan offers that are right for you and with clear scores triple lock guarantee you could get pre-approved offers rates and credit limits that could save you money including exclusive offers from halifax because at times like these, we all need a bit of certainty. Sure. Download the free ClearScore app now to see your triple lock offers and join the 13 million people who are ClearScore sure. Coral Slots tournaments are back with the free-to-play Beat the Banker. Choose your game. 
beat the banker's score to win free spins and land a place on the leaderboard to win a cash prize. Can you beat the banker? Play for free at coral.co.uk. Where do we start? <laughs> well, how do you sleep? He gets cold. And she's always hot. Our exclusive Slumberland mattress helps keep warm sleepers cool and cool sleepers cosy. Oh. At Benson's for Beds, you can make your bed your way this winter with up to 50% off. Plus, you can buy now, pay absolutely nothing until 2024. Benson's for Beds. Sleep made better. Get something this January that'll keep on giving and giving with PlusNet's award-winning fibre broadband and great customer service. For just $21.99 a month on an 18-month contract, get set up for the year ahead. Offer ends 1st of February. Search PlusNet Fibre now. Someone must have been spying on me. You're risking everything. Still don't trust me, do you? I would never do anything to hurt Abby. The Catch continues Wednesday at 9 on Channel 5 and My 5. Relax. Simba Hybrid Mattress sponsors evenings on Channel 5. Back in 2003, Clarkson had just taken control of Top Gear and its popularity was soaring, as was his notoriety. Jeremy makes headlines wherever he goes, and I think sometimes he's not careful about what he says. In October 2003, Jeremy Clarkson was invited onto the last Concorde flight from the US, where he encountered the then editor of the Daily Mirror, Piers Morgan. He was the editor of a tabloid newspaper, back when tabloid newspapers were somewhat gloves off in their approach to celebrity and so lots of things that should have remained private in people's lives were being shared with the newspapers. Piqued by Morgan's coverage of him in the mirror, Clarkson tipped a glass of water over him. It was the start of a decade-long feud. I don't get on with Piers Morgan. I, I, I editor know, of the but, Daily Mirror. But. Yeah, the editor of the Daily Mirror. It was the uh, British Press Awards, so the Oscars of the British media in London. Everyone was there, every editor, every top journalist, every top photographer. Jeremy and I had been nominated um, for the shortlisted for Motoring Journalist of the Year. So we were sitting on the sun table and uh, Pierce was there as editor of The Mirror. Jeremy Clarkson had repeatedly shocked the nation, but punching his producer was one step too far for the BBC. They sacked him, and Clarkson suddenly found himself without an on-screen job. Millions of Top Gear fans around the world held their breath as they waited to see what Clarkson would do next and what would become of his co-presenters. Will you stay at Top Gear? Um, well, I don't want to talk about that too much, but I think we're very much, the three of us, as a package, it works for very complicated reasons. In solidarity, James May and Richard Hammond decided to leave the BBC too, and they started to plan their future. We started in a tiny little office in Marylebone, um, and there were only two chairs in it, so we took it in turns to sit down, and we had a stationery cupboard, and there was a highlighter pen in it and some A4 paper, and that was it. Right. And we had to start, we thought, right, Right. No one quite knew what they'd do next, but somehow it would have to be as big as Top Gear. After months of speculation, it was announced that Jeremy Clarkson, James May and Richard Hammond would be given their own show on Amazon Prime. It was a huge coup for the streamer. Names were incredibly difficult. So what did you reject? Which were the ones you reject? I think I have a few. Three of driving along was my okay, favourite. Okay. <laughs> I see why they passed on that one, but... Well, uh... it was a really good name. It was one of our directors came up with that, because that's what it is. The Grand Tour launched on the 18th of November 2016. 
The first show opened with a dramatic and show-stopping scene filmed in the Californian desert. And I don't think anyone will forget the opening sequence in the desert. I mean, it was just absolutely amazing. The hero shots of the presenters' cars were cut to a performance of I Can See Clearly Now, played by the Hot House Flowers. Adding to the theatre of the moment and cementing the intention of Clarkson and the team to come back even bigger and better than before. The opening scene of the Grand Tour was absolutely phenomenal. It was incredible. Um, it was amazing for Amazon. I think it, it really, their subscription must have gone up for Amazon TV. But there were some who felt that the new set and the show format was all very familiar. It is Top Gear with a higher budget. That's what the Grand Tour is. And actually, TGT, there's, there's some play. It feels like it's sort of just a rearrangement of the, the letters in Top Gear almost. It doesn't matter what the Grand Tour is called. What we were paying for and what we want to see is those three guys together. And it is, you know, it's a special thing. The Grand Tour. No, that's, uh, that's the dream job. What shocked everyone was its extraordinary success. It drove up Amazon Prime subscriptions more than any other original Amazon series. But it is just three old men bickering and falling over. It, I mean, we should have called it Last of the Summer Wine. The Grand Tour employed the same old tricks Top Gear had used, and that kept people watching. So Jeremy Clarkson has this very famous hatred of caravans and I guess caravans are sort of the natural nemesis of the car. In the past, Clarkson realised that his hatred of the caravan was a rich source of comic potential. He'd regularly ridiculed them, including in 2010 on Top Gear, when Jeremy was once again stuck behind one on the road. Caravans. Get out of the way! <laughs> Pull over once in a while, once every 300 miles. Pull over! Caravans are funny. I mean, let's be honest about it. A caravan is funny. The idea that you're going to have a little kitchen, a couple of beds and a toilet and a fridge, and you're going to tow it on a trailer behind you, that is funny before you even start. He's always hated them. And they've always been this comedic part of the show. Well, I don't know why he hates caravans. If you make love in a caravan, it bounces. And at my age and at Jeremy's age, we need all the help we can get. But in 2021, it seemed caravans themselves had had enough of being constantly ridiculed by Jeremy Clarkson. There was this marvellous moment on the Grand Tour where it looked as if caravans might finally get their revenge. While filming in Scotland for the Grand Tour Presents Lockdown, his car's tow bar broke off and he was dramatically nearly overtaken by the caravan he'd been towing. Speed camera's on it. That's how you know it's not the A9. Oh, no! The caravan became unhooked or unhinged and hurtled towards Jeremy Clarkson, who afterwards said he thought that his time was up. He thought that he was going to be annihilated by a ricocheting caravan. Clarkson's caravan lay unceremoniously in a ditch. He later told The Sun newspaper, God, I'm having the biggest accident of my life. I think him going either under the wheels of a caravan or pulled off a cliff by a caravan or something like that, there will be a certain poetic justice to that. And I think even on the way down, he will appreciate it and smile. Despite, or perhaps because of, Clarkson's near-death experiences, the Grand Tour was a huge success. But there was one part of the Top Gear format they couldn't bring with them. The Stig. Instead, they had to recruit a new test driver. Enter racing driver Abby Eaton. I grew up watching Top Gear, so to be able to actually work with the guys as well is something really special. Jeremy's always got to have like the biggest or the loudest or the fastest of whatever it is. People really need to kind of remember that he is there to, you know, entertain, to shock, to maybe say things and, and push the bar on, on certain humour aspects that maybe are a little bit questionable at times, um, but ultimately he, I think genuinely deep down, doesn't really want to offend people to heart. But true to form, Clarkson and his fellow presenters didn't tell their new driver anything about their plans. So, back in 2019, when Clarkson challenged Abby to race him on a frozen lake in Sweden, 
she wasn't prepared for the shape of the track he designed. Jeremy was in the Lamborghini Urus and I was in a Porsche Turbo S and it was to do some ice driving, but they wouldn't tell me um, what the circuit was like. So I rocked up on the morning of the shoot. All the lads were laughing and giggling and sniggering and I was like, okay. It wasn't long before the design of the racetrack was revealed, surprising Abby and shocking the audience. There was a massive penis in the ice that I had to basically drive around with, with uh, Jeremy. And then, what shape shall we have the racetrack? I will have it as a giant penis. <laughs> Unusual. My mother-in-law watched it and, and just how we laughed. She's 85. I thought, oh, we've got the spirit of Top Gear back here a little bit. Jeremy decided his track design had never-ending comedic potential and didn't hold back. Right round the bell end. It was a bell end on the top, which actually had a bell. So every time you went past, they'd ding the bell. Now down the shaft. I've raised against a few dicks in my time, but never on one. Yeah, a lot of fun. <laughs> Poor Abby Eaton, I hope she's not defined by this. <laughs> it's stupid. It's really silly. And she handles it really well. She says, I can't believe I just said that. Um, she... <laughs> At the end of 2019, just before lockdown, Amazon announced Clarkson's new project, one which had the potential to offend a whole new section of society. The scourge of environmentalists and climate change campaigners shocked the world by becoming a farmer. But could he pull it off without upsetting the whole of rural Britain? I remember just thinking, oh, my gosh, he's about to just offend every farmer in the nation. They have been through enough. All that stuff Jeremy Clarkson said about the environment and all the other stuff he said about global warming over the years, now he's a farmer. But Clarkson clearly had no idea what he was about to undertake. I thought farming was a part-time thing. You know, you just put seeds in the ground, weather happens, food grows. And then you sell it, and yeah. then you get a subsidy check and you buy a Range Rover. How hard can it be? <laughs> <laughs> Ended up calling the farm Diddly Squat, because that is how much money you make from farming. <laughs> you, you go to see into his life, his, his slight cluelessness, which is very endearing. To everyone's surprise, even though Clarkson didn't have a clue how to farm, he took the role seriously. It was just so great, because you just saw the other side. Virtually everything he touched going wrong. But it's very funny as well. I mean, mainly it's funny because you're so useless. Clarkson's farm was one of the first times that Clarkson showed a more vulnerable side, happy to reveal how inexperienced he was at his new profession. I have absolutely no clue. What the fuck are you doing up here? Oh, shit, and Bobby. Shit, shit, fuck. Jeremy is willing to be self-deprecating. He's willing to say that he knows nothing about the subject. He doesn't pretend like he's an expert. You've got a check shirt and you've got muddy jeans and you've got big boots and you <laughs> think you're there. You've even got the tan, which we had this time <laughs> yeah. last year, you know, because it was so hot. And I was there and I just couldn't do anything. Yeah. And then you knew you'd made a mistake and then people came and shouted at me. But he does get his hands dirty, and he shows, I think, a, a much softer side. He suddenly realised this guy doesn't phone it in. When he's doing a show, he's properly present. You're not I'm very much a trainee farmer. But you're a farm owner. <laughs> yeah, I've got the farm and I work on it every day. I've been on it all day today. Clarkson, as a friendly, positive force on British television, was a whole new direction for the previously divisive presenter. The show was a huge success and won plaudits for revealing the true difficulties of being a farmer in the UK. Clarkson's Farm, you could say, has done more for farming than any other television show in the last three decades. Coming up, Jeremy's elaborate farming methods wreak havoc. He's got a, a Lambo as a, a tractor. He goes big, he goes much too big. But in December 2022, after huge success and with a second series about to drop, Clarkson was once again in the spotlight with one single newspaper column. John Nicholson from the SNP wrote to ITV and Amazon asking them to take Jeremy Clarkson off screen. In 2021, Clarkson becoming a farmer was a surprising reinvention, 
and despite his amusing efforts, he was clearly serious about making a go of it. To his audience, it appeared that a new, more mature Clarkson might have emerged. It was the first time I've done a TV show ever where we didn't ever have any sense of a script, and, and pe people rarely understand what's meant by a script. But this wasn't scripted reality. It, wasn't, it, it was pure reality, and that's rare on TV, very rare. Jeremy's approach to farming seemed to be genuinely naive, rather than creating controversy for laughs. Oh, my God, this thing is enormous! And none more so than when he bought a giant Lamborghini tractor that was so large he struggled to get it down the Oxfordshire country lanes. Of course, only he would buy a Lamborghini tractor. It is ridiculously expensive. I can't remember how much money. It is vastly bloody expensive. It is huge. I mean, all tractors are big, but this is like, this is like a tractor on steroids. Early on in Clarkson's farm, it was clear that he would tackle the challenges of farming as he did everything in life, without thinking about the consequences. Parking his enormous tractor was classic funny Clarkson, but this time the only victim was himself. Oh, hello. Wait, 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 wait. Oh, shit. And here's a guy unable to fit his rather ridiculous Lamborghini tractor into the shed. But you wonder, don't you, when you watch it, just how much, as usual, is for the telly. It's as bright as a button. So, obviously, part of it is for the show. But what's classic, and again, he doesn't over... It's just the right dialogue he throws in. Clarkson didn't receive much sympathy from his girlfriend, Lisa Hogan. That's too big. <laughs> it isn't. It's... It isn't. The, the shed's too... Enormous. Or from his land agent and advisor, Charlie Island. It's quite large. But it is a big tractor. I think it's a vast tractor. Yeah, sometimes he goes a bit over the top and perhaps is a little bit of a caricature of himself, but it's telly, you know, and you need that drama, you need those big gold moments. It was soon clear that making money farming was hard, so Clarkson did what many farmers do, diversified. But he immediately ran into trouble with his local council and villagers as he tried to get permission for a farm shop. As with most of Clarkson's farming escapades, planning a farm shop wasn't going to be simple. As we can see in this clip from the show, a typically frustrated Clarkson was having trouble persuading the locals. What? I got some bad news from the council. The villagers objected to my um, farm shop plan for the following reasons. He has sort of come to loggerheads with the local council, locals. And I think it all kind of stems back to the fact that if he wants to do something, that is what he wants to do, and he will not compromise. Time and again, Jeremy Clarkson had to face the council. First, he couldn't get permission for his shop, then his cafe, there were numerous complaints about his lack of parking and concerns over traffic chaos. There had just been, you know, problem after problem with this farm shop. So he's now, he's now got a shop that's out of control. He's got a traffic jam to his farm shop. It's just amazing. Whilst this may have seemed like Clarkson up to his old tricks again, there was a big difference. This time, it wasn't a stunt. He goes to battle. He wants various things on his farm. He wants a cafe, he wants a farm shop. Whether you like Jeremy Clarkson or not, you end up rooting for Diddley Squat Farm and Jeremy Clarkson. You want the farm to succeed. I think people see in him a kind of Robin Hood, you know, kind of avenging the little chap's misery by taking it out on the council. I throw a fairly well-known Halloween party most years. But last year, he couldn't come to the party because he was going to come. He said, well, come in, I'm coming with you. He said, I can't make it. I'm stuck in a parish meeting about some planning permit and I'm not going to get out to at least nine. And I would rather be anywhere on earth rather than here, but I have to be here. So I know how seriously he takes the farm, but I also know that it must be kind of exhausting as well. What are you going to be saying to local people tonight? I'm, I'm just here to listen, because you know, gossip spreads in villages and they don't know what we're doing. So I thought, well, the best thing I can do is come down and say, this is what we're doing. And then it isn't gossip anymore. So it seems sensible to me. It's never going to be plain sailing with Jeremy. So it's going to be chipping Norton Council. It's going to be the residents who, who don't want the queue to the farm shop. 
then it's the planning, the planning people at the council. I'll see you outside. They've built a wicker man down there. It's a good shot, <laughs> Clarkson may have been battling with the authorities, but his authentic quest to get his farm working had changed the public's perception of him. Jeremy Clarkson was winning the hearts of the nation, so much so that the UK's most popular presenters, Anton Deck, even felt safe enough to play a prank on him. Anton Deck, they pull these brilliant pranks on celebrities, and they decided to do one on Jeremy Clarkson, where they turned up to his farm as protesters. No more please. No more toilets. Clarkson found the crowd protesting about rights for soil. They lure Clarkson in and try to get a, a bait a response out of him. And I think Jeremy Clarkson's girlfriend was, was in on the prank as well, which is brilliant. As a seasoned prankster, the tables were turned when Anton Deck played a prank on Clarkson for Anton Deck's Saturday night takeaway. Anton Deck pull off a magnificent stunt. They say they're there on behalf of the earth. They say the earth has feelings and it really is horrible to be nasty to the earth. And they have a whole load of uh, fellow protesters all with their placards and everything else. I think the slogan was don't hurt the dirt. So when you push your cultivator through that, yeah. it, it's crying out in pain. <laughs> and one of them actually like, handcuffs himself to Jeremy's Range Rover. They get a digger and pour soil all over his car. And... and actually, to his credit, he keeps a lid on it pretty well. He doesn't deck anyone, he doesn't punch anyone. He swears a little bit, but then you'd expect that under the circs. <laughs> This new, calmer Clarkson, in the face of adversity, was a significant departure from his previous outbursts. Because he's on Anton Deck's Saturday night takeaway. Hi, Jeremy! And when eventually Anton Deck revealed themselves, he took it in his stride without losing his temper. It was all going so well. Clarkson, it seemed, was becoming something of a national treasure. But then, suddenly, at the end of 2022, he stunned the world by writing an explosive article in his column in The Sun. More than 6,000 complaints have been made to IPSO, the independent press standards organisation, following comments made by Jeremy Clarkson about Meghan Markle in a newspaper column. For many years, Jeremy Clarkson has been writing a popular column in The Sun. He comments amusingly on current news stories, and his views about life. I always think he's, he, he writes as he speaks, and not everyone speaks in an interesting way, so it doesn't work for everyone, but that's his style. But in December 2022, he filed one of his most shocking columns to date, in response to the Duke and Duchess of Sussex's polarizing series, which had just dropped on Netflix. He dreams of the day, he says, when she is paraded naked through the streets of every town in Britain while the crowds chant shame and throw lumps of excrement at her. Sometimes Jeremy Clarkson stops you in your tracks, you read what he's written or you hear what he said and you think, my God, did he really say that? His comments drew immediate protest across the country, even from his daughter. One person who very vociferously complained is Jeremy Clarkson's own daughter, Emily. She said she stands against everything my dad wrote about Meghan Markle, and she said she's always been clear when it comes to misogyny, bullying, and the treatment of women by the media. It doesn't matter how many times he gets, you know, in hot water because of it, he will keep saying the wrong thing. Soon, his comments had caught the attention of Parliament. This morning, more than 40 MPs from different parties wrote this letter to the editor of The Sun, asking her to retract the article and to sanction Jeremy Clarkson. With outrage building, broadcasters were asked what they planned to do about him. John Nicholson from the SNP wrote to ITV and Amazon asking them to take Jeremy Clarkson off screen. Jeremy is incredibly confrontational and belligerent. Having said that, I think when he has made a, a mistake that's a painful one, I think he will apologise and admit that. Literally in the last few minutes, David, we have finally had a comment from Jeremy Clarkson about this. Um, one line, he says he is horrified to have caused so much hurt, and he says he will be more careful in future. 
In response, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex accused Jeremy Clarkson of writing articles that spread hate rhetoric, dangerous conspiracy theories, and misogyny. In January 2023, a source told Variety that Amazon's Prime Video is likely to part ways with Clarkson beyond the already commissioned series of The Grand Tour and Clarkson's Farm. For decades, he'd got away with causing controversy. He'd been encouraged and indulged by broadcasters, producers and newspaper editors. There's nobody alive today who hasn't left a party thinking, oh, God, why did I say that? Everybody goes, oh, no, I said somebody's frock was terrible or their baby was ugly. We all do that all through our lives. We all make mistakes. And luckily, if you say it to just one person, it's not so bad, it's just that we do it, particularly me, it tends to be in front of millions. And you just go, oh, no, I've said that out loud. He's willing to be bold and brash and get himself in trouble and get himself into all sorts of bother with the press or with you know other people in the TV world. He doesn't actually care. And I think uh, that's what makes him unique. So does this latest shocking episode mean the end for Jeremy Clarkson? As his future hangs in the balance, public opinion, the media and politicians are turning against him. After a career of outrageous statements, stunts and shocks, Love him or hate him, has the self-made king of controversy finally gone too far? Enjoying a party-packed journey around the Med, Sheridan Smith returns with a new series of The Cruise. Welcome aboard, brand new next Sunday night at nine. Next to night, the moment Bruce Forsyth went walkabout and an embarrassing encounter with David Hasselhoff when TV guests go horribly wrong in just a bit.